Uh, as we move on uh, to today's keynote address, I want to take one last moment to acknowledge last night's discussion with uh, unprecedented discussion with Attorneys General Barr Sessions and uh, Ashcroft, uh, so ably moderated by Beth Williams. And I thank you, uh, General and Mrs. Ashcroft, for, for being with us today. Uh, one of the great takeaways from that discussion is that the rule of law and indeed Western civilization has been under steady attack for decades from enemies both external and internal and remains in great peril today. And as we were so vividly and horrifically reminded on October 7, 2023, the state of Israel remains very much on the front lines of that conflict as it has been for decades. Scenes from our college campuses cheering on that day's events reminded us that there's a common enemy at work here and that a threat against Western civilization anywhere is a threat to civilization everywhere. With those events so fresh in our minds and following in the example of our 2022 Florida Chapters Conference, conference lunch panel on the rule of law in Cuba, uh, the conference organizers thought it appropriate and timely to dedicate today's time to reflect on the current state of affairs in Israel and provide broader, broader context on the five thousand plus years of history and conflict that have, has led us to this pivotal point in time. To do so, we're fortunate to have one of the bright stars of Florida's federal judiciary, the Honorable Roy K. Altman. A brief introduction to Judge Altman. On April 4th, 2019, Judge Altman was confirmed to a seat on the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida. At 36, he became the youngest federal district court judge in the country and the youngest federal judge ever appointed in the Southern District of Florida. Judge Altman received a BA from Columbia University where he played quarterback on the football team and pitched for the baseball team, earning all Ivy honors. I personally have compared him to the great Sid Luckman. Look him up, one of the greats. Uh, judge Altman received his JD from the Yale Law School where he was projects editor of the Yale Law Journal. After law school, the judge clerked on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals for the Honorable Stanley Marcus. <laughs> judge Altman then became a federal prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami, where he twice received the director of the Executive Office of U.S. Attorney's Award for superior performance by a federal prosecutor. In 2013, Judge Altman was named Federal Prosecutor of the Year by the Miami-Dade Chiefs of Police and the Law Enforcement Officers Charitable Foundation. In 2014, Judge Altman became a partner at the Miami law firm of Podhurst Orsek, where he very ably represented the victims of airplane crashes and bank fraud conspiracies until taking the bench in 2019. I am proud to call Judge Altman a colleague and a friend and honored to introduce him here today. And I hope that as you reflect on Judge Altman's talk today, uh, I hope that you all join me in silently praying for peace in our time for the benefit of all the people in the Middle East, whether Jewish, Muslim, or Christian. Let's give him a warm Federalist Society welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Roy Altman. Charbel, and uh, many thanks to the Federalist Society for <clears throat> allowing me to speak here today. You know, in my interview with Senator Nelson, when I had been nominated, uh, people were very nervous about how that interview was going to go. And I sat down with Senator Nelson. First question, he says, I see here you've been a member of the Federalist Society since your first year at Yale. <clears throat> and I said, yes, sir. He said, I didn't even know they had conservatives at Yale. And I said, well, there were a few of us. And he said, he said why would you do that? It's a, it, you know, tell me about this organization. I said, sir, it's a debating society. It's a way for people to hear multiple perspectives, which, after all, is what law school is all about. And he looks at me, and he looks at his staff, and he looks at me, and he looks at his staff, and he goes, well, that sounds pretty good to me. And his staff's like, no, 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 wrong answer. 
You know, I had, um, I've been given speeches about Israel since October the 7th, and since I talk all day in the courtroom and then speaking every night around the country, and I developed a large polyp on my vocal cords. I just had to have surgery to remove it. And the doctor says, you got to be completely silent for eight days, like the miracle of Hanukkah. And as I was about to like protest, like, hey, can't we like cut it down? My wife goes, can't we make it 14, doctor, just, just to make sure? And now the weird thing is at parties since then, some of my friends' wives, they come up to me and they're like, hey, Roy, can I chat with you for a second? I'm like, sure. And they're like, hey, don't you think so-and-so buddy of yours, he sounds a little hoarse these days? I'd be like, no, he sounds fine. Well, well, can't we get him that surgery where he just shuts up for eight days? I want to talk to you about what Charbel just mentioned. But I want to start with context. On October 7th of 2023, thousands of Hamas and other terrorists, including about 1,000 Palestinian citizens, raided Israeli villages, towns, and kibbutzim, and what we call the Gaza envelope, the people who live on the border with Gaza. When they crossed the border, of course, they invaded a sovereign country, and they had done so in direct violation of a prior ceasefire that most people forget about today that had persisted on October 6th and October 5th and October 4th, all the way back to the last war. And they killed everyone they could find. They killed women and children and babies. They killed children in their parents' arms. They killed septuagenarians and octogenarians and Holocaust survivors. They beheaded them. They strangled them. They mutilated them. They raped hundreds of women. In fact, if you'll remember the videos of many of the hostages who were brought back kicking and screaming across the border into Gaza, many of the women's uh, pants were dripping with blood because they had been gang raped so viciously. And then, of course, they took 240 Israelis hostage, brought them back across the border, and held them in holes hundreds of feet beneath the ground, surveilled by real-life monsters. Some of those hostages have been released and have told uncountable stories about rape, humiliation, and torture during their captivity and 136 of them, including a baby who just turned one year old, are still in captivity in Gaza. But some would say that the most surprising aspect of this massacre, the most horrific attack on Jews since the Holocaust, isn't necessarily what happened on October 7th, not to minimize it. It's what happened on October 8th and October 9th and all of the intervening days since on Western campuses and in Western schools and Western media outlets. The way the West has reacted, in particular young people all across this country and in Europe, to the horrors of October 7th has been as disappointing to so many of us as it was surprising, because it misses the point. The point is that it wasn't an attack on Jews or Israelis alone, that it is just a part of a broader war for the heart and soul of Western civilization, and that Jews just happen to be at the vanguard of that war. The reason that college campuses have been aflame about what happened in Israel and on the wrong side of it for the four or five months since October 7th is because young people in this country have become infected by several myths about Israel. And they are those myths that I hope to discuss with you and refute with you here today. The first myth, the most important myth, the myth that you hear over and over again is that Jews are colonists in the land of Israel that Jews are the latest manifestation of white colonialism in the world. And yes, October 7th was terrible, but they say decolonization is an ugly thing. We've seen it over and over again. 
Why would we expect this to be any different? Folks, nothing could be further from the truth. The fact of the matter is that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. We'll start in 1208 BC. That's over 3,200 years ago. Ramses II, the great builder of ancient Egypt, had a son. His name was Merneptah. At Ramses' death, he becomes Pharaoh himself. And he builds for himself a great temple in Thebes, the southern capital of Egypt, on the River Nile. And in that temple, he has his scribes construct a stele. A stele is a giant basalt stone, looks kind of like the tablets that you would expect Moses to bring down from Mount Sinai if Moses could carry a 10,000 pound stone. It's black, it's about 10 and a half feet tall and 12 inches thick. And it recounts all of Merneptah's military victories. And at the very bottom, at the very bottom of Merneptah's stele, Merneptah's scribes wrote that he brought his army into the land of Israel. And there he fought at Ashkelon and Gezer, two places that are still in Israel today. And he brought his army into the field and defeated Israel in battle. Not Palestine, not Judea, he defeated Israel in battle, and he says, and I wiped his seed from the earth. His seed is no more. Now, of course, I'm still here, so that's not totally true. But we know that as of 3,200 years ago, there was a kingdom run by Jews called Israel in the land of Israel today, and that it was ruling the land and fighting battles to protect the land from its foreign enemies, even at that early date. Folks, Muhammad wasn't born till the year 570 A.D. Islam doesn't exist until the 620s A.D. That means that this is over 1,800 years before there was even such a thing as Islam in the Middle East. That's the southwest border with Israel. That's Egypt. Moving to the southeast border. In 840 B.C., a Moabite king, a Moabite king, those are the people who ruled the place we now know as Jordan, on the east side of the Jordan River. A Moabite king talked about how he had been subjugated by the people of Israel who lived across the river. And he said, the people of Israel had subjugated my towns, and so I made war against them in the name of Shemosh, my God. And I brought my army into the field, and I defeated the house of Omri. The house of Omri, if you remember from your Bible, Omri was the, one of the first kings of the kingdom of Israel in the north. And I fought against the tribe of God, G-A-D, he said. You'll remember that God was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says about the tribe of God, they lived in that land, the land of Israel, since ancient times. Even in the 840s BC, people in Jordan understood that Jews had lived and ruled in Israel since ancient times, even at that early date. Moving up to the northeast border with Israel, where Syria is today, in the Kirk monolith, composed in 852 BC, a giant stone tablet written by Shalmanassar III, the king of the Assyrians. He talks about how he took the battle against seven armies, one of them being the army of Israel. And the army of Israel was headed by the Israelite king named Ahab. You thought it was just a guy who chased white whales. But actually, he's a Jewish king from the Bible who brought, according to Shalmanassar, 10,000 Jewish warriors and 2,000 chariots in 852 B.C. to the battle site. He says that he defeated the Israelite king and killed Ahab in battle. Folks, this is thousands of years ago. And then finally, on the northern border of Israel, to take you all the way around the country, in Tel Dan, the border with Lebanon, the northernmost point of Israel, archaeologists have found the Tel Dan stele. 
The Tel Dan Stele was composed in the 870s BC, even earlier than King Mesha Stele, even earlier than the Assyrian king Shalmaneser's monolith. And in the 870s BC, the Aramean king, that's where we get Aramaic, the language of the Bible from, the Aramean king Hazael, who's talked about in Kings in the Bible. He comes down to Israel and defeats the northern Israelite kingdom in battle and turns Jehoshaphat, the Jewish king, into his vassal. And in fact, we have found since then a monolith that shows Jehu or Jehoshaphat kneeling and providing sustenance to his sovereign lord, the king of the Arameans and Assyrians. We have found that in modern day Syria, folks. This is thousands of years ago. And it doesn't end there. In the 600s BC, we have found a fort in the south of Israel at a place called Arad. In Arad, we have found 108 potsherds. They are ostracons. They are clay ceramic tablets onto which people have inscribed letters that pass from one place to another. We know that at Arad, there were about 30 soldiers and their supervisor, their officer was named Eliashub, and all of the ostracons are directed and addressed to Eliashub, or responses from Eliashub, and they say, hey, bring me soldiers, I need more wine, the kinds of things you would expect to find at a garrison. Guess what, folks? All of them are written, not in Arabic, not in English, because, you know, on TikTok they think we Jews were from Brooklyn, you know. Not in Polish or Russian or Yiddish. They're written in Hebrew, the same language that Jews still use and write and speak in in the land of Israel today. It all came to an end about 20 or 30 years later. In 586 B.C., the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II, Babylonia is what we now call Iraq, brought his army into Israel and fought a giant battle with the Judeans and destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple that Solomon had built in the 970s BC. And he takes all the Jews and he pushes them into exile in Babylon. And the Jews live in Babylon for almost 50 years until Cyrus II, Cyrus the Great, a Persian king, defeats the descendants of Nebuchadnezzar in battle all over the Middle East and takes over all of the Babylonians' possessions, including the land of Israel and its capital, Jerusalem. But he takes a different view of the Jews. He says, you know what? I don't want you in exile. You Jews, go forth to the land of Israel and rebuild your temple. And that's what they do. The Jews come back in the hundreds of thousands, back to the land of Israel, and they begin the construction of the second temple, the outer retaining wall of which, the western wall, we Jews still worship at today in the land of Israel. That construction, by the way, ebbs and flows for the next 500 years. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the Jews rule the land of Israel as vassals of the Persian king with their own temple in Jerusalem, their own coterie of priests in the temple, and their own high priests, their own religious practices, and their own laws for the next 200 years until 329 B.C. when a young Macedonian general named Alexander the Great comes into the land of Israel and defeats in battle after battle Darius I, the descendant of the Persian kings. He defeats him most notably at the Battle of Gaugamela and takes all of Darius's Middle Eastern possessions. In fact, he confiscates his baggage train and takes over his family. And of course, along with that baggage train and Darius's possessions, Alexander conquers Israel and the Jewish people and its capital in Jerusalem. But he was busy with conquering the world. So like the Persians, he said, let's let the Jews run themselves. And he allows the Jews to govern themselves with their own high priest and their own laws and their own religious practices until he dies mysteriously in India six years later in 323. At that point, his empire is divided among his five best and favorite generals, his satraps, we call them, the most important of which was Ptolemy. Ptolemy takes over Egypt 
and parts of the Middle East, and he gets Israel. And his descendants rule Israel from Egypt, but they too say, let the Jews govern themselves, and the Jews have their own temple with their own priests and their own currency in the land of Israel thousands of years ago. Until about 200 B.C., Ptolemy gets into a border dispute with the satrapy that had run the kingdom of Syria after Alexander's death. The general was named Seleucus. We call him Seleucus, even though we shouldn't be pronouncing the C that way, but I digress. And Seleucus forms the Seleucid Empire, and he and his descendants get into a struggle with the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemies decide you can have the land of Israel. So the Seleucid Empire, the Greeks now take over the land of Israel, and they rule the land of Israel for 33 years, from 200 to 167 B.C. But in 167 B.C., they go too far. The Syrian king, the Seleucid king, Antiochus IV, he starts to clamp down on Jewish religious practices in the temple. He prohibits the biblical practice of circumcision, and the Jews say, we've had enough with being vassals. And that's when Judah the Maccabee comes from the town of Modi'in. Folks, the town of Modi'in, a town that is as Jewish and vibrant today as it was in 167 B.C. when the Maccabees, four brothers, sons of Matthias, lead a revolt that takes 27 years but ultimately is successful. They slough off Greek and and Syrian rule and they form their own kingdom called the Hasmonean Dynasty of Jewish Kings. You don't hear this at Columbia University. In 140 BC, a dynasty of fully sovereign Jewish kings takes over in the land of Israel with their own priests in the temple, their own currency, their own laws, their own religious practices, no longer sovereign to any foreign power. And they rule in the land of Israel until 63 B.C. when Pompey Maximus, Pompey the Great, comes into the land of Israel, along with Egypt and other places, destroys the Ptolemaic dynasties, destroys the Seleucid dynasty. Of course, the Romans take over almost all of Alexander's old possessions and takes over the land of Israel and its capital in Jerusalem. But Pompey had other problems. His wife dies. She was Julius Caesar's daughter. And they get into a life or death struggle that ends when Pompey Maximus is beheaded as he comes into Alexandria. And we're off into the Roman civil wars. Four Roman armies take the field. One headed by Octavian, the other by the Senate, another by Brutus and Cassius, and finally one headed by Mark Antony and Cleopatra. That war doesn't end until 31 BC when Mark Antony and Cleopatra are destroyed at the Battle of Actium. And that entire time, the Jews are allowed to govern themselves in the land of Israel. But one important thing happened in the intervening years. In 40 BC, there was a civil war in Israel between two competing Jewish armies. You thought we were in Brooklyn back then, but we weren't. We were in the land of Israel, and there was a civil war, and the Romans picked a side. And they picked the side of a man who came from the south of Israel. We're doing it on purpose, folks. We started in the center of Israel, Jerusalem and Modi'in, and we're moving to the south of Israel to show that Jews have governed this land, all of this land, for thousands of years. In 40 BC, the Romans picked the side of a general from the south of Israel, from the Negev Desert, and his name is Herod. He becomes Herod the Great, one of the great, first great kings of Israel, since the kings of the Bible, since Saul and David and Solomon. And with Roman help, he wins the civil war in Israel and becomes the first Herodian king, the first of the Herodian dynasty of Jewish kings that rules in Israel, starting in 37 BC. And he continues the rebuilding of the second temple that had begun 500 years earlier, until his death in 4 BC, and 4 BC is a very important year because most scholars believe that it is in 4 BC, the year of Herod's death, that Jesus Christ was born. Jesus Christ, despite what you might have heard on TikTok, was not a Palestinian Arab, folks. Jesus Christ was a Jewish man born in the town of Bethlehem, 
And I say Beit Lechem, not Bethlehem, because that is its name. Beit Lechem means in Hebrew, house of bread. When he's one year old, he moves to the north of Israel. And yes, we're going to the north of Israel. He moves to a city in the north of Israel called Nazareth, Nazareth. And he becomes a prominent rabbi in the north of Israel. And he preaches all over the Galilean region and on the Kinneret, the Galilean Sea, all of which are still in the land of Israel today. And he becomes a great leader of the Jewish people and comes down to Jerusalem and finds that the Pharisees are not abiding by the spirit or the rule of Jewish law. The Pharisees, folks, are Jewish priests in the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. And that all plays out in the New Testament. But the point, of course, is that when you walk the steps of Jesus Christ to the church of the Holy Sepulchre, you are following the footstep of a Jewish man in a Jewish city from a Jewish kingdom who was even then, thousands of years ago, part of an ancient tradition of Jewish governance in the land of Israel from that early point I mentioned to you before. And Jewish rule in Jerusalem continued until 66, 66 AD. In that year, Nero was emperor. Nobody really liked Nero. And the Jews didn't like him either. Again, he clamped down on Jewish practices. He prohibited circumcision, and the Jews revolted. They led a revolt that lasted about four years. They initially won some big battles, including a battle in the north where they slaughtered a whole Roman legion, but ultimately Rome brought overwhelming force down into Israel and defeated the Jews. Vespasian was the general. You may know he then becomes emperor himself. And his son Titus, who would also be emperor after his father, breaks into the temple in Jerusalem, burns the temple down, and takes many of its most prized possessions, including the Ark of the Covenant and the menorah, the giant menorah that was in the temple, and brings them back to Rome. If you've been to Rome, you will see this on Titus's arch in Rome. This is in Rome. You can see it in Rome, the destruction of the Jewish temple from 70 AD. But there's a pocket of resistance that continues. Jews continue to fight a guerrilla war against the Romans for three years, all throughout the southern desert, throughout the Negev, and throughout the places that were attacked on October 7th. They get cornered at a winter palace on the eastern edge of the desert near the Dead Sea. And there's about 200 of them and their families up on the top of this palace. And that is where King Herod had built his winter palace. It's called Masada. Folks, I have been there on many occasions with my family. It is still in Israel today. Actually, my family, there's a big joke in my family there. The way you measure my trips to Israel is you've got Roy this big at Masada, Roy this big at Masada, Roy this big at Masada. Roy keeps getting bigger. Masada stays the same size. Ultimately, the Romans lay siege to Masada, and the Jews, rather than become slaves, kill themselves on the top of Masada. And we have still found the potsherds, the lots that they drew to decide which order they would kill each other in because each man killed another man who had the lower number until the last man killed himself. Those potsherds are in Hebrew, folks, 2,000 years ago. The Jews then are ruled very tightly by the Romans until 132 AD, when again it gets to be too much and another Jewish revolutionary from the north, Simon Bar Kokhba, Simon son of the star, comes down with a Jewish army and sloughs off Roman rule for three years, rebuilds the kingdom in Jerusalem and issues his own currency. Folks, you can go to the British Museum and see these coins. You can go to the Israel Museum and see these coins. You can even get some of them on the internet for thousands of dollars, as, I, as it turns out I saw this morning. There are thousands of these coins, and they are amazing. On the front part of the coin, there is the facade of the second temple the second temple the Jews had built in Jerusalem when Cyrus brought them back from exile in 538 B.C. 
the same second temple whose outer retaining wall, the western wall, we Jews still worship at today in Jerusalem 2,000 years later. And on top of the western wall, the facade of the second temple, there is the Star of David, the emblem that still adorns the center of the flag of the Jewish state of Israel 2,000 years later, an unbelievable connection to our past. But that isn't all. On the inverse side of the coin, in Hebrew letters, around the periphery of the back of the coin, around a lulav, which is the branch that we Jews still use to commemorate the exodus from Egypt 3,000 years ago. Around the lulav is written a phrase that is on thousands of these coins. And the phrase is year one for the redemption of Israel. Not Palestine, not Judea, not Zion or Jerusalem, year one for the redemption of a land and a kingdom and a people that had existed for 3,000 years. And it's because of those coins, folks, that in 1948, fast forward a long time, in 1948, when it came time to decide what are we going to call this new land, this new Jewish redeemed land in the land of Israel, that David Ben-Gurion and his committee voted six to three over other options like Judea and Zion to call it Israel. Because, folks, that was year one in the redemption of the land of Israel. Because that was year one in the reconstitution of a land that had existed for thousands of years, commemorated unambiguously on Bar Kokhba's coins that have been found now all over the countryside. After the Romans fell in 409, 410 AD, the Byzantines took over Israel. And you'll see that now the land of Israel becomes ruled by one succeeding foreign occupying army after another. After the Byzantines in the 630s AD came the Rashidun's, the first of the occupying Muslim forces. And they ruled from Saudi Arabia. They're the descendants of Muhammad. They ruled in the land of Israel for about 100 years. And then they lost it to the Abbasids from Damascus. And the Abbasids from Damascus lost it to the Umayyads from Baghdad. And the Umayyads from Baghdad lost it to the Fatimids from Egypt. And the Fatimids lost it to the Seljuks from Turkey. And then the Crusaders came in 1099. And they were there for a couple hundred years. And then Saladin and his armies took it. And then Saladin's descendants lost it to the Mamluks from Egypt. The Mamluks are an amazing people, by the way, a slave army from Egypt that took over almost all of the Near East. And the Mamluks ruled as foreign occupiers in the land of Israel until 1517, when a growing and ultimately overwhelming empire from Turkey, the Ottomans, took over most of the Mamluks' possessions, including the land of Israel, and they occupied it as foreign colonists for 400 years, until the end of World War I in 1917, when the British army took over the land of Israel. Folks, if anyone has colonized the land of Israel, if anyone has occupied the land of Israel, it has been this succession of foreign Arab and Muslim armies that have ruled as foreign colonists in the land of Israel for about 1,600 years. And in 1917, the British take over and they say, what are we going to do with all these people? They haven't governed themselves in 2,000 years. So they said, you know what? We're going to create mandates. We're going to tell them how to be civilized. We're going to teach them about tea and right honorable gentlemen and all that other stuff. And then they're going to be ready to, ru to run themselves. And that's what happened. 30 years later, in 1947, the British said, we're done with these people. And they brought it, a petition to the United Nations. And they said, let's partition the land between the Jews and the Arabs. Now, they did that in large part because of something that happened in 1918. One year after the war was over, 
King Hussein of the Arabs, one of the great heroes of Arab history, the leader of the Arab revolt against the Ottomans, along with the British. King Hussein writes an op-ed. He writes an op-ed, not in the Wall Street Journal. He writes an op-ed in the Al-Qibla newspaper, the Mecca Daily News. And he says, if we Arabs want the British and the world to care about our claim to our ancestral land, which we want back now that the Ottomans are gone, then we cannot deny the Zionists' claim to their ancestral land in the land of Israel. This isn't me. This is the leader of all the Arabs, King Hussein himself. And he says at the end of the op-ed, and I quote, the Jews are the original sons of that land. And if you don't care about King Hussein, nine months later, on December the 29th of 1918, King Hussein's son, Prince Faisal, who becomes king of Iraq, the first king of Iraq, who was the general with T.E. Lawrence, if you've seen Lawrence of Arabia, who was the general with T.E. Lawrence, who led the Arab armies in their heroic assault against the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I. Prince Faisal, future king of Iraq, has a banquet in his honor thrown by a bunch of British dignitaries along with Lord Rothschild. And he stands up and gives a toast. And at the end of the toast, he turns to Lord Rothschild. And he says, we Arabs cannot in good conscience deny the ancestral home of the Jewish people. And he turns to Lord Rothschild and he says, to my Zionist friends, I say to you, welcome home. Folks, Jews aren't colonists in the land of Israel. Jews are indigenous to the land. In fact, if Jews do not belong in the land of Israel, we belong literally nowhere else. As Barbara Tuchman once wrote, if you look around the world 3,000 years ago at all the people that lived and existed at that time, there is only one people that still speaks the same language, that still practices the same religion, and that still lives in the same land they lived in 3,000 years ago, and that is the Jews who live and govern in Israel. The second false claim about Israel is that what happened in 1948 was illegitimate. The Jews aren't legitimate sovereigns over the borders they now govern. Totally and unambiguously false. Remember what happened. In 1948, the United Nations mandate expired. In 1947, the combined nations of the world voted in combined General Assembly to ratify the Jewish claim to the land and recognize the indigenous nature of the people of Israel. Folks, there are really three ways in which a nation can become a state. You can win it in a war, and there are two kinds of wars. There are offensive wars, and there are defensive wars. Second, you can have a long presence in the land, well established. Third, you could have a Legal deed, a deed that says, I have a right to this land, just like you would in your home. Let's take a look at Israel's legitimacy under all three prongs. First, we've already established. The Jews have won the land of Israel in war after war after war. 1948, the day the mandate expired, the Jews accepted the partition voted on by the United Nations, and the next day, May 15th, 1948, six Arab armies rejected the partition and invaded. Everyone in the world said, Israel is done. We gave them a chance, but those Jews are going the way of the dodo bird. But guess what? The Jews won that war. And they won a war against Egypt in 56 in the Suez. And they won a war against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria in 67. And they won a war against six Arab armies in 73, and they won in southern Lebanon in 82, each war, each time, accumulating more and more land, which they would use as buffer zones, buffer zones against enemies who refused even to recognize its right to exist. Folks, those wars were wars of survival. 
existential wars, unquestionably legitimate under international law. The second prong of our stool, Jews have a longstanding presence in the land. We've already seen Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel. They've been there for thousands of years. Third leg of our stool, do we have an international decree? Do we have a legal deed? Absolutely. We've got a mandate from the United Nations, voted on 33 to 13, recognizing the ancestral home of the Jewish people and reinstituting year one in the redemption of the land of Israel, unquestionably legitimate under international law. Let's compare it to other countries around the world. Let's look at the United States, for example. First prong, we won it in a war, we won our land in a war, but it was a war of offense. George III didn't want this war. Yes, his policies led directly to the war. We didn't like the policies, and we interrupted British soldiers as they were heading in Lexington and Concord to do the duty that the king had instructed them to do, not to kill Americans, to take our weapons away. Was it egregious? Were the laws bad? Absolutely. Did we start the war? We started the war. Still, no one would deny that Americans are legitimate sovereigns over the land that we now govern. No one would dispute that. Second prong of the stool, second leg of the stool. Do we have a presence on the land? We have some presence on the land, but we're not indigenous to the land. We haven't been here for thousands of years. We got here in 1607 as Englishmen. We were Englishmen at Jamestown. It wasn't really until 1761, as Professor Amar has written extensively, that we started to consider ourselves Americans. It was at a trial in Boston where James Otis was the plaintiff's lawyer and John Adams and Samuel Adams were young men seated in the gallery, very much moved by the patriotic things James Otis was saying and John Adams would write years later, it was quote, then and there that the child revolution was born, end quote. And of course, 15 years later, that led directly to the separation. It was in that courtroom in 1761 that we, for the first time, started to say, you know, we're different than they are, and they aren't treating us right. Is it legitimate under international law? It's unquestionably legitimate under international law. Third prong, do we have a document? Well, we have the greatest document of all time. We have the Declaration of Independence, and it was written by and it was voted on by, well, us ourselves. We declared that we are an independent country. It was written by Thomas Jefferson and edited by the other four members of the Committee on Style. John Adams, Ben Franklin, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston, all Americans, all patriots, all rebels. And then it was put to a vote of the Continental Congress and it was ratified. We don't have an international decree, at least not at that time. But folks, no one would deny the legitimacy of our government or our sovereignty over the land. It would be absurd by comparison for a Cherokee tribesman and his two or 3,000 buddies to go to Atlanta tomorrow morning and murder 1,200 of our citizens, or to be exact in per capita numbers, 40,000 Americans in Atlanta, Georgia, and then to say, well, I was just reclaiming my ancestral land, so you can't be upset. It would be absurd for a Mexican national to cross the border and murder 40,000 Americans in San Diego and to take 4,000 of them hostage back to Mexico and hold them in holes against their will because he was just reclaiming his ancestral land. No one would dispute that that would be both amoral and illegal under international law. And yet, on college campus after college campus, the legitimacy of the one Jewish state in the world is consistently questioned, even though, even though these other countries in the Middle East were all created in the same way, by the same people, at the same time. Think about Pakistan created in the same year that Israel was 
reconstituted in 1948, drawn up by the English. No one disputes the legitimacy of Pakistani rule over its borders. Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, all created out of thin air in the aftermath of World War I. Nobody disputes their legitimacy. Only the one Jewish state in the world is constantly derided for being illegitimate. Ask yourselves why. Folks, the three prongs, the three prongs, the three ways in which a nation can become a state, Israel meets every single one, as much or more so than any other country in the world. They are legitimate sovereigns over the land they govern. There can be no dispute about that. The third false claim about Israel is that it is an apartheid state. Folks, nothing could be further from the truth. Let's talk about what apartheid means. Apartheid refers to a policy in South Africa from the late 40s to the early 90s. And apartheid, the word, is actually an Afrikaans phrase. It means aparthood, and it means separateness. And in fact, apartheid was marked by incredible and horrific separateness. The first apartheid law in South Africa was an anti-miscegenation law. Blacks and whites couldn't marry. Blacks and whites could not marry. And it went on from there to pervade almost every aspect of South African life. Blacks couldn't drink from the same water fountains, use the same restaurant. They couldn't vote, live in the same neighborhoods, buy land, lease land, drive in the same trains, buses, or trolley cars, go to the same beaches, use the same sports facilities. It was like Jim Crow on steroids. It was horrid. Folks, Israel has a population of 9 million people, and 21% of them are Arab Israelis, Muslims living in the Jewish state of Israel with full commercial, civil, and political rights. Full commercial, civil, and political rights. Let's go through each one. Any Arab citizen, commercial rights, any Arab citizen can get a license, become a truck driver or a lawyer, buy property, lease property, become a tenant, open a business, sell a business, use a restaurant, go to a sports facility, build their own sports team on equal rights and equal terms with any Jewish citizen in the land. Civil rights. If you get arrested as an Arab citizen, you get a free public defender just like any Israeli lawyer uh, defendant gets. You get all the due process protections in court that any Jewish citizen would get. You get to have any of your religious practices. In fact, if you go to Nazareth, where Jesus Christ became a rabbi, Nazareth in the north, there are 77,000 citizens in the town of Nazareth today, and 90% of them are Muslim Arab Israelis. If you've been to Nazareth as I've been, you've seen it's full of mosques with Arab Israelis worshiping and facing Mecca five times a day in the Jewish state of Israel. Folks, if Jews are running an apartheid state, they're doing a real bad job of it. And political rights. Every Arab Israeli can hold office, run for office, vote for office on equal rights with any Jewish citizen. In fact, in the Supreme Court of Israel, there is an Arab Israeli Supreme Court justice there are 10 members of the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament, par parliament, who are Muslim Israeli. Folks, apartheid, this is not. The fourth claim about Israel is that Israel has occupied Gaza since 2005. Folks, this is the most frivolous one of all, if you can believe that. In 1948, Gaza came under Egyptian rule, and it was ruled by Egypt until 1967. No one thought, let's give them their own country, because there was no such thing as a Palestinian state in world history. There was no such thing as Palestinian sovereignty, as there was Jewish sovereignty. It was all created after 1967. So no Egyptian thought, we're going to let them have their own country. It was Egyptian land. 
What happened in 1956, I mentioned to you before, a war for the Suez Crisis. Israel and Britain and France fought a war in the Sinai Peninsula, and afterwards, the United Nations said, you know, we're going to go into Gaza, and we're going to create a security buffer zone in Gaza to prevent Egyptian incursions onto Israeli land, same land that would be attacked on October the 7th. By the way, these are the people, you've seen these peacekeepers, they wear the blue helmets, you've seen these people before? We didn't know then what we know now, which is that UN peacekeepers are really just very bad at only one thing, and that is keeping peace. In 1967, Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, said, hey, you guys with the blue helmets, you look great, but get out of here, and they did. And so Gamal Abdel Nasser militarized the border, fought a war against Israel, and lost. And at that point, Israel does occupy Gaza. They said, we had enough of all these wars with the people who were living in that territory. And so they occupy Gaza for the next 38 years, until 2005. And in 2005, Ariel Sharon, you maybe re remember, becomes Prime Minister of Israel. Ariel Sharon was a hero of the early Israel-Arab wars. In fact, in 1973, it was Ariel Sharon, in an incredibly bold maneuver, who encircled the entire Egyptian Third Army until they literally started to starve to death in the Sinai. And then Kissinger flew to Israel and met with Golda Meir and said, please don't let them starve to death in the desert. And the Jews gave them a ceasefire. That's Ariel Sharon, a lion of Jewish history. And he becomes prime minister and he says, you know what? I'm going to solve the problem myself. I'm going to disengage from Gaza. And he ordered, it was incredibly divisive in Israel. It tore the country apart. He ordered all Jewish settlements destroyed in Israel. And he took all the soldiers, and he took all the facilities, and he took all the 8,000 citizens who were living in Gaza, and he pulled them out kicking and screaming back across the border. He even went so far as to order the rabbis to go to the cemeteries and to disinter the Jewish bodies in the cemeteries to say to the Palestinian people, you make your own state here in Gaza. You're by the water. You get billions and billions of dollars in aid from the United States and Europe and other countries around the world. Every year you can be a Singapore in the Middle East. One year later in 2006, Hamas overwhelmingly won the election in Gaza by promising to fight a never-ending war of extermination against the Jews. And one year later, in 2007, they had completed their complete control over Gaza by executing or exiling almost all of the members of the Palestinian Authority. Those are the people who run what's called the West Bank, the other side of Israel. Exiling them or murdering them by throwing them off buildings. That's why Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas in Gaza, he's called the butcher of Gaza, not because of what he does to Jews, it's because of what he did to other Arabs in his forcible coup in Gaza. They haven't had a single election since. And many people believe that the many wars that Hamas has started with Israel since 2005, including the war on October 7th, were a direct result of Israelis disengaging from Gaza in 2005. Whatever else might be said about Gaza, the claim that Israel has occupied Gaza since 2005 is utterly and verifiably false. The fifth claim about Israel and the final claim about Israel that I wish to dispel for you tonight is the claim that Israel's military response has not been proportional, has not been proportional under international law. Before I do that, let me say one thing. The loss of a single civilian life is a tragedy. And that's true whether that's a Muslim life or a Jewish life or a Christian life. There can be no question about that. But that is not the question we ask under international law for two simple and obvious reasons. First, every war that has ever been fought has resulted in countless civilian casualties. 
That's what war is. It is horrible. That's what Sherman told us. War is hell. It is horrid. And it creates civilian casualties. That's what it is. But that doesn't make war illegal. International law enshrines the right of every nation to defend itself, including by war. But second, but second, the way that Hamas is fighting this war is a warning to all of us. It's a warning to all of Western civilization because Hamas has re-engineered the laws of war. Hamas has deployed the cheat code on the laws of war. What do I mean? They've realized that if I am bad and I kill Jews, well, then I will be killed, and I don't want that. But if I am doubly bad, if I am doubly bad, I kill Jews, and then I embed myself in my own civilian population, thus endangering the lives of Palestinian civilians, then I can get away with it. We lawyers deal with this all the time. Imagine a defendant steals money from a plaintiff. Plaintiff hires a lawyer, sues in court, brings a lawsuit, gets depositions, some discovery, gets his day in court, gets some money back, some redress. But imagine that the defendant was so bad, that he was doubly bad, that he defrauded not just that one plaintiff, but hundreds of plaintiffs. Well, then he's going to have the attorney general and federal prosecutors all over him, and he's going to get indicted in federal court. And now the defense lawyers are going to come to the judge, and they're going to say, whoa, 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 we can't do civil discovery now. You can't depose my client. We can't answer interrogatories. My client has a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. What would we be saying if we allowed that? You stay the case for three years while the criminal case proceeds through the courts. Witnesses die. Witnesses forget, evidence gets lost, justice delayed, is justice denied? We're always careful about that. But the West wants all of us to do that with Hamas. They want us to say, they want the West to say, if you're bad, you will be punished. But if you're doubly bad, you can get away with it. Folks, international law cannot dictate that result or the laws will just swallow themselves. If Western societies cannot fight back against enemies that are doubly bad in that way, then we are teaching them a lesson that if they kill innocent civilians, there is nothing we can do in response. Under international law, we ask ourselves five questions, and we've already answered two of them. One, are you a legitimate military sovereign? And we've already seen that Israel is a legitimate sovereign. Why do we ask that? Because if you're Boko Haram, and you blow up a military installation and you kill even one civilian. We don't say that was proportional under international law because you should have been bombing things in the first place. You're not legitimate. Israel obviously meets that first factor. Second question, were you provoked? If you're Putin and you invade Ukraine without provocation claiming genocide without any real evidence, and you bomb a military structure, and you kill even one civilian, we're not going to say that it was proportional because you shouldn't have been there in the first place. Israel was attacked on October 7th by Hamas terrorists who perpetrated the most heinous assault and murder and rape on Jewish victims since the Holocaust. Unquestionably provoked. Third factor. What is the evil you mean to eradicate? What is your objective in this war? Folks, this factor is very important because we know that if it's a jaywalker, for example, we can't drop a 2,000-pound bomb on him. That would be disproportionate. What is the evil that Israel means to eradicate? That's the question. We know from prior assaults on Western countries that when the evil you mean to eradicate is itself genocidal, when it is itself diabolical, when it poses a threat to the continuation of Western civilization, a great deal of force may be required. Think about Nazi Germany in World War II. 
We and our allies killed millions of German civilians. That's not disputed. It's horrible. That's what war is. But few people would dispute that that was proportional under international law because it was necessary to destroy the genocidal regime that Hitler had built in Nazi Germany. In Japan, we wiped out 200,000 people in the blink of an eye. It was horrible. But the government felt that it was necessary to root out an enemy that was going to use kamikazes and its significant defensive fortifications to kill almost a million Marines when we landed on the Big Island. Few people would dispute today that that is proportional under international law. But we don't have to go back to ancient history. In 2004, four American service members, contractors, were killed and their bodies mutilated in Fallujah. The Marines laid siege to Fallujah and made the city for the next few weeks almost uninhabitable thereafter. We killed hundreds of thousands of civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan, not on purpose, but as the collateral consequences of lawful military activity. Few people would dispute that that was proportional to our objective of destroying Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even more recently in Mosul in 2012, it had become the home, you remember, of ISIS, which was beheading, burning, and crucifying not just Christians and Westerners, but other Muslims. We and our allies laid siege to Mosul for nine months. It took nine months. 90% of the buildings in Mosul were destroyed. It was virtually uninhabitable thereafter. No one disputes that that was proportional under the laws of war to eradicate the evil of ISIS. Folks, Hamas has said over and over and over again through their spokespeople that October 7th was not a one-time thing. Ghazi Hamad, their spokesman in Lebanon, told Lebanese TV the other day that October 7th was just the beginning, that Hamas will do this over and over and over again until every Jew is gone. And he was asked, well, you built all these tunnels for your fighters. What about for the civilians? Oh, no. We need the civilians to be martyrs, he said, so that the West will force Israel into a ceasefire, which we will use to regenerate our arms and bring October 7th and 8th and 9th upon them over and over again until from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, folks, means a country from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea with no Jews on it. So when we ask ourselves, what is the evil that Israel means to eradicate? What is its objective? This is no jaywalker. The fourth factor, what have you done to minimize civilian casualties? Folks, the German Air Force chief went to Israel. This is Germany. Germany's Air Force chief went to Israel, reviewed their military plans, reviewed all the protocols they go through before every strike. As we do here in America, Israel has lawyers who review every strike for legality before it's conducted. And the German air chief said, it is the most moral air force in the world. Israel has done more, he said, to preserve innocent Palestinian lives than any other Air Force would do in the circumstances. And we know that from the facts that have come out. Israel sends hundreds of thousands of text messages, issues hundreds of thousands of leaflets and flyers, issues maps on all of its websites which show the Palestinian civilians which areas will be attacked at which days and on which times. Folks, I was a football player. When you're on offense, surprise is the name of the game. And that's no less true in the military. Israel has relinquished the power of offensive surprise in order to preserve innocent Palestinian lives by telling Hamas exactly where it means to assault before it issues its orders. It has done so at great cost to the lives of its own soldiers in order to preserve and protect 
innocent Palestinian lives. What other country in the world would do that? Israel has an entire agency called COGET that provides humanitarian assistance to Palestinians and has opened up humanitarian corridors for eight hours every day, which we know Hamas terrorists have used in order to evade capture. But they do it to preserve innocent Palestinian lives. Folks, Israel has done more, as the German air chief said, to protect innocent Palestinian civilians than any other country in the world would have done. But of course, Palestinian civilians are being killed as a direct result of Hamas's unspeakable practice of using its civilians and their infrastructure as human shields because, as Mr. Hamad told Lebanese TV, they need martyrs to trick Westerners into taking their side. Let's not fall for that trap. The fifth question, what was your intention? We care about that in the law. If you murder somebody in a premeditated fashion, you could get the death penalty, certainly go to prison. But sometimes we kill people by accident as the collateral consequences of otherwise lawful actions. We're driving, we're not careful. We make mistakes, we kill somebody. It's horrible. But we're not gonna get the death penalty. We're not gonna go to prison, we may have to pay some money. We recognize in the law that your intention matters. Folks, Israel has no intention to kill Palestinian civilians. If Hamas put down its weapons and released the hostages, the war would be over tomorrow. If Israel put down its weapons, as Ben Shapiro once said, there would be a second Holocaust. Folks, Israel has nuclear weapons and complete air superiority. It has nuclear weapons and complete air superiority. Israel does not want to kill innocent Palestinian civilians, and the proof is in all of the actions they have taken at cost to their own soldiers to protect them. Folks, I want to leave you with one thing. There is this claim now that anti-Zionism isn't anti-Semitism. We don't hate Jews, people will say. We just hate the Jews who live in Israel. Never mind that that's half the world's Jews. We don't hate Jews, they will say. We just hate Jews who fight back. We don't agree with raping and mutilating women and girls. We don't agree with that. In fact, we protest it when it happens to other people. For example, when Boko Haram does it to girls in Africa, we just kind of don't care if it's happening to the Jewish women and the Jewish girls who live in Israel. We don't think that babies and octogenarians should be taken from their homes, have their parents and children tortured and murdered in front of their eyes and then held in damp, dank, dark holes by real-life monsters for 50, 60, 120 days. We don't agree with that. That's horrible. But we kind of think it's okay and won't complain when it's being done to the Jews who live in Israel. Every country, we think, has a right to defend itself against terror, against invasion, against aggression except for the one Jewish state in the world. Folks, make no mistake. There is no distinction. What is Zionism? I want you to remember this, if nothing else. Zionism is a noble ideal. It is the recognition that for 2,000 years, Jews have been agents of history. Jews have been acted upon, played upon, subjugated, humiliated, made into the other. And Zionism is the recognition that now Jews will be actors in history, that Jews will have the right and the obligation to stand up for themselves, to fight back if required, with reprisals that are strong and forceful and which deter 
just like any other nation in the world does. Kissinger told us that weakness is provocative. And if Israel gives a ceasefire to Hamas after the events that I have only begun to scratch the surface of for you here today, after the horrors of October 7th, before the hostages are released, before Hamas is demilitarized and destroyed, that weakness will be provocative for decades to come. That will be the end of Israel. So when you hear people crying out for a ceasefire on October 8th and October 9th before a single hostage has been released, when you hear even now people crying out for a ceasefire without demanding the return of the hostages, or the demilitarization of Hamas. Remember that what they are really saying is you Jews go back to the firing squads of Babi Yar. You Jews go back to the camps and go into the showers and do not object. Take it like the Jews that you are. Take it without complaint like you've done for 2,000 years. So Zionism is the promise that we Jews will never go back to Babi Yar, that we will never go back to the camps, that we will never go back to Auschwitz and Dachau and Treblinka again, because we Jews, we the Zionists around the world, and we Americans as their greatest ally, we do object, and that is the meaning of Zionism. Thank you all very much. Thank you.